Hello and welcome to Life on Mission 2020. Our theme this year is On Mission Together because our goal for our time together this weekend is to grow in our ability and capacity to share the gospel uh, with our neighbors, in our communities, in our workplaces, and among our families. Uh, this evening, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Jim Singleton, who comes to us from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, where he is the professor of evangelism and pastoral leadership. Uh, Dr. Singleton has years of pastoral ministry experience, in addition to having taught on this subject uh, for seminaries across the country. On Saturday, tomorrow, we will be hosting a panel discussion, uh, and so if you would like to submit questions for our speakers or for uh, Pastor Bruce or myself on these topics, we hope that you will take just a minute to email us at lifeonmissionquestions at gmail.com, where, we'll where we will be collecting questions for our speakers uh, to tackle on Saturday afternoon. I will remind you about that as we continue along, but if you think of questions uh, that you would like to submit, we hope that you'll just take a minute to email them to us uh, so that we can gather them and be preparing for our panel discussion tomorrow. I hope that this time is a blessing to you. Let's pray together as we begin this evening. God, we pray that um, during this year's Life on Mission conference that you would be at work, that you would be equipping your church for the work that you call your church to carry out, and that, Lord, you would convict us of the ministry that you have given to each of us, that you would remind us of it, and that you would uh, convict us to move forward in obedience to that call. Uh, God, we are grateful that um, the work you give us to do is work that you equip us to carry out, and we pray that by your Spirit you would be doing exactly that uh, during our time together during this year's conference. We pray for Dr. Singleton. We pray that you would speak through him and that you would minister to us uh, through this time that we have together this year. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, welcome to your missions conference. Glad to be here even by this means as we're in the middle of this coronavirus. Um, but it's a great time to pause and to think through what is God up to at this season of our congregation's life. And so it's an honor for me to be here and be with you from Gordon-Conwell Seminary. And I'm grateful. Let's pray as we begin. Lord, open our eyes to see what's changed about the church and how we go about being who you've called us to be. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the things that is often apparent when a child is just starting out in sports is you, you have to clarify for them what game we're actually playing. Uh, I've got a little six-year-old grandson, and earlier when he was four, you know, just to take him out to a little league baseball practice was not clear to him what game we were playing. The kids would sometimes try to kick the baseball, which is a hard little small ball to kick because they weren't sure it wasn't soccer that we were playing. So you have to painstakingly make sure we understand, now what is it we're playing? And that's, in some respects, apparent to the life of the church these days. For actually, we're living in a time where there are three different congregational paradigms at work in the church in North America. And many congregations are unaware of this, and so we're not sure exactly what game we are now playing. The three are called Christendom, the attractional church, and the missional church. And so in this session, uh, I'm going to try to help you understand what are those three paradigms and what's characteristic of them, and then we can begin to process Westgate Church. Well, what one of these paradigms are we actually a part of? So paradigm number one is what we call Christendom. Now, Christendom is a phrase you've probably heard before from a Western Civ class because Christendom was, at one level, what was that unofficial kind of wedding of church and state that went on in medieval Europe, where at one time, probably in Europe, every kid had been baptized. That's how the whole society was Christendom. But let me read for you a quote from a friend of mine as he's talking about uh, the culture today and the church. At the start of the 21st century, the church in North America finds itself in a very different place than it used to be. 50 years ago, the church enjoyed a privileged place in our culture. Many people went to church. The social pressure encouraged good people to belong to a church. People respected the church. The church listened 
that the culture listened to the church. Politicians and government officials wanted the church on their side. The church was very much at the center of public life. The church was booming. And that world no longer exists. The church is like Rip Van Winkle, waking up from a 20-year nap. We're living in the same country, but it's a completely different world. We don't recognize it. We're not sure really what to do about it. Now that quote from a man named Clark Cowden was really a quote that is now almost 20 years old. So looking back, that was talking about the 50s, especially uh, the 1950s, maybe the early 60s, which was a very Christianized decade, the most Christianized decade in American church history. Uh, I served a church right before coming to Gordon-Conwell Seminary, very much a product of a Christendom mentality right in the center of downtown, uh, very much a wedding of church and culture in so many respects. Leslie Newbigin said this about Christendom, the synthesis between the gospel and the culture of the western part of the European peninsula of Asia, by which Christianity had become almost the folk religion of Western Europe. It was so pervasively Christian that you couldn't really escape it for really centuries, as, as Newbigin was talking. So Todd Boldzinger writes that Christendom is, sociologists and theologians refer to this recently past period as Christendom, the 1700 year long era with Christianity at the privileged center of Western cultural life. Christendom gave us blue laws, the Ten Commandments in school, it gave us under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, an exhortation to Bible reading in the national newspapers. So, so let me tell you a story that would illustrate that so you can get a feel for what Christendom was like. It was June the 6th, 1946. The place was Prospect Park, Brooklyn, New York, a wonderful, beautiful park. June the 6th should ring a bell. That's D-Day, uh, 1944. So this was two years to the day from the landing at Normandy. But the parade was really not about that. The parade was for another reason. There were actually 90,000 children in this parade at Prospect Park on a Thursday. New York schools, like schools up here in Massachusetts, are not out of school, naturally, on June the 6th. Their schools go till about the middle of June. So all of these children somehow were out of school on a Thursday, and parents got them there, and they were all dressed up. And it had to do with some event that was not D-Day. They passed by a reviewing stand on which was the governor of New York, the mayor of Brooklyn, and even a United States Supreme Court justice at this parade. What was the parade? Well, the parade was simply the 117th annual Sunday School Parade. It was a parade that happened every year. And it was the wedding of church and culture in a way that you could let all these kids out of school on a Thursday to go to a parade to celebrate their being in and a part of Sunday school. And that parade happened every year until the 70s when it was finally discontinued because of lack of interest. But this parade went on for a long, long time. Now, what you begin to think about it, you think, wow, that was such an unusual era. A United States Supreme Court justice on the reviewing stand. It couldn't happen now. It's not possible. So let me give you some snapshots. Christendom was that era of American culture when we actually had the best sermon from a Sunday on the front page of the New York Times on a Monday. That happened for decades. Pastors being present at presidential inaugurations, no sporting events on Sunday. In fact, where I grew up in the South, there were no sporting events on a Wednesday night because that was church night. The Blue Laws closed stores on Sundays, and so throughout my childhood, living mostly in the South, there was nothing you could buy on a Sunday morning. 
Bergen County, New Jersey still has blue laws even to this day on Sundays. Chick-fil-A still operates as if blue laws were in vogue. We're not going to open on a Sunday. <clears throat> Christendom was the unconscious wedding of church and society. The society supports the church by giving us tax breaks, zoning laws, blue laws to give no other uh, competition for Sunday mornings, Public school and church cooperation was present until 1962. I still remember hearing Bible uh, passages read over the loudspeaker in my elementary school classroom and a morning prayer. They allow us freedom of religion, which is part of what it means really to be an American. In turn, the church supports society by praying at inaugurations, by having chaplains for Senate and the House of Representatives, by doing invocations at Rotary Clubs and sporting events, by signing wedding licenses for the state or the county or the city. Uh, and in Christendom in the United States, the height of it was post-World War II. The highest church membership and the highest church weekly attendance happened in that decade just after World War II. It had long been present, certainly present in uh, much of Europe before the Enlightenment, but the United States had its peak. A lot of people that are part of American churches today grew up in their formative years in Christendom. Christendom congregations, you wanted them to look like a church, you wanted them to have a, a, a tall steeple, to be a center of the community to have fixed pews that we would only use for one thing in this one room. We, we really believed that buildings carried a lot of the evangelistic appeal, that if we would build it, they would come, much like the field of dreams philosophy. And so churches in Christendom had to have an attractive looking building that looked like a church because that's what people were looking for as the symbol uh, in this culture. And we built lots of churches in those decades, those years, just after World War II. 1945, total cost of buildings in the United States for churches was $26 million. By 1950, it was $409 million. By 1960, we were spending a billion dollars a year on church buildings. And there are countless church buildings built in the 1950s all across the country. Not as many in New England. Our churches tend to be older, but this is a big part of American society. And so to understand Christendom, Dave Olson writes, in the Christian world, Christendom defined how ministry was done. The needs of the members, the doctrine of the church, the structure of the institution defined ministry model and practice. The pastoral role was to attend to the members and to keep the ship sailing smoothly. The assumptions of a Christendom congregation is that everyone knows the faith. We learned it at home. They were focused on smaller neighborhood context where you would have a church within a geography and you tended to go to your denominationally aligned church within that geographic area. Worship was what we would today call traditional. It was inspiring, it was pastoral, the preaching tone was formal. If you were part of a mainline church, brand and place were very important. You would go to the nearest Methodist church if you happened to be a Methodist. Lots of social fellowship surrounded churches. It was the third place. There was home, there was work, and there was church, or home and school and church. It was functioned in many respects like a social club. We would have church softball, church basketball, church bridge groups, the members were taught to serve the church. The church was not in the business of equipping people for mission out in the world. Pastoral care was emphasized. The pastors were focused on a chaplaincy model. We're there for you. We're going to do your weddings, your funerals, your baptisms. We're going to help you in all of life's transitions. Discipleship was actually de-emphasized in this era of the church. And what we did have was knowledge-based and elective in nature. You mainly got your character shaped from your life at home. You were raised right by your parents. You were belonging primarily to an institution. It had to be the parachurch that actually resurrected discipleship because the church was having Christian education, 
but it really wasn't a formal plan of building a disciple of Jesus Christ. We saw evangelism primarily as a ticket to heaven or membership recruitment or even cultural assimilation. So much was assumed by many congregations and people would simply join uh, lightly as they were joining a Rotary Club or joining a Kiwanis Club. And actually sometimes the Rotary Club would demand more of you than the church. Evangelicals were always concerned with, with a little more here. Uh, we wanted to make sure that somebody who was just a church member actually really met Jesus. And many pastors did evangelism, and the church really assumed that's who would do evangelism. And for by and large, we functioned in what I would call a little Bo Peep theology of evangelism. Now, if you don't remember the old nursery rhyme about little Bo Peep, it actually uh, goes like this. Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them. I insert the word strategy here. Leave them alone and they'll come home wagging their tails behind them. The Christendom Church didn't do much looking for lost people. We waited till they naturally came home. We assumed they might go sow their wild oats in their college years, and then when they had children and got married, they would come back and they would be part of us. But even little Bo Peep understood that maybe they weren't coming back. Second verse was little Bo Peep fell fast asleep and dreamt she heard them bleeding. But when she awoke, she found it a joke, for they were all still fleeting. They hadn't come back. It took verse 3 before any action occurred. Then up she took her little crook, determined for to find them. She found them indeed, and it made her heart bleed, for they'd left their tails behind them, meaning they got hurt out in the world. So even little Bo Peep recognizes what a Christendom church has not always recognized, that we can't just leave them alone and they'll come home. In the Christendom church, mission was seen as something far away. Global missions was very important. Home missions, we thought, was effectively finished. You realize it was in the 1950s that we had established a church in every place in the United States where there was a post office. And so we thought we had done the work. We had reached the whole country. Certain traditions always had a mission of wanting to do a little something more, to have an authentic relationship with Christ. But still, mission was mostly seen as across the waters. Preaching was mostly inspirational in this era of coming to church to get your tank filled for the next week. If you happen to be in a mainline church, it was usually light on content. Um, sometimes in an evangelical church, we were focused on making sure the conversion was there or that we were moving toward a deeper life. But we assumed people mostly knew the story. And many sermons from that era would begin with, now you know the story of Daniel and the lion's den, or you know the story of Jonah and the whale, or, or you know the story of Jonah and the Ninevites. But we didn't know those stories because discipleship had been slowly eroded. Now you can trust this with the early church, which urged believing and behaving and belonging as integral to the life of the Christian and in the Christendom church, we just sort of belonged because there was really no other Sunday morning competition and nothing else to do. And we were more or less there. In Christendom, things were very building centered. Encounters with unbelieving people were expected to happen at the church. We wanted them to get here. The building was seen as sacred space, and we needed to build large fellowship halls, which mostly occurred in later periods of time. In the early church, remember, they had no buildings, no printed materials, no internet, and they had to reach a population through word of mouth, mostly neighbor to neighbor. The Chinese church it, it has done that in spades. They have no buildings. They have rented buildings or borrowed buildings. They have a few church buildings, but they have to reach people person to person because they're not waiting in China for people just to show up at the church. But Christendom has actually had incredible challenges since the mid-60s. We've had a hard time reaching multiple generations of young adults. 
We've lost many of those generations. And the Christendom model of waiting for them to come to the church building has simply not worked for around the last 50 to 55 years. So we've been in this crisis for a while that has increased with each subsequent generation. The United States culture changed amazingly in the 60s. We became an anti-institutional kind of culture. We had rebelliousness against power. We went through a sexual revolution, a musical revolution, the dominance of television for the first time, a very unpopular war, uh, race and gender blind spots were exposed, and liberalism began to be published popularly and, and landing on college campuses in major ways. The culture really has changed under our feet, and Christendom failed to understand that new culture, which was anti-institutional, which had relaxed dress, uh, where Christian rock music began to dominate in lots of ways. The parachurch responded. They knew to reach folks on college campuses and military bases, they would have to adapt. But as a church, well, we kind of waited for them to come until really the 70s and 80s when paradigm number two emerged which we now call the attractional church. We realize that we're not going to get people to come just simply being who we are at the center of towns. We're going to have to do something more. The attractional church was actually aimed at that first generation that was drifting away from the church, the baby boomers. And we attracted people to drive past weak congregations to get to much stronger congregations with entrepreneurial pastors where we were hearing the gospel in some respects in new ways. The early pioneers of that were people like Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel, Rick Hybels, Willow Creek, Rick Warren at Sa Bill Hybels and Rick Warren at Saddleback, Walt Calstad, Community Ch Church of Joy in Phoenix, John Wimber in the Vineyard. The these were all designing and redesigning church to be a much more attractive and attractional kind of building, still hoping they would come. The targets? were primarily baby boomers. Everything we did in those early years was aimed at one generation. How can we get the baby boomers back to church? And many of them actually came back to church because they had left partly because they were bored with church. Now there was something to come back for. So McDonald's hamburgers were popular in those 50s and 60s. And remember, McDonald's would only give you that hamburger one way back when they were 15 cent hamburgers. A menu was offering you this pure beef hamburger for 15 cents or a tempting cheeseburger for 19 cents, golden French fries, thirst quenching Coke. But the McDonald's hamburger, the genius of it is that every one of them was made the same way. And you just took what they gave you and all of them had a rather modest piece of beef. And on the buns would be ketchup, a couple of pickles, and little bitty chopped up onions. If you didn't like those on your hamburger, you had to do surgery on your hamburger. I would have to take the pickles off, put them over here because I hate pickles. Then I would have to get a napkin and dab the hamburger meat to get pickle juice off of it because it was contaminating. Then I would look at that bun that had the ketchup and the embedded little bitty onions and I'd have to scrape it off and I'd have to do it kind of carefully because it usually took most of the bun with it and I would be left with this eviscerated bun. I would get my own French's mustard, which is what belonged on a hamburger in my opinion, and I would redoctor it and suddenly have a new one. If you had asked McDonald's to do that, they would say, no, that's going to take 30 minutes because we only do it one way and you've got to take what we offer. Along comes Burger King. And Burger King is driven by the consumerism that's present in the late 60s and early 70s, which says you, you can actually have it your way. And so if you get a bunch of baby boomers in the room in a church, we can actually sing the Burger King jingle because we remember it. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us serve you today. Have it your way, have it your way. At Burger King, well, there it was. It got into us. And so in the attractional church, we said, we don't want that church the same old way. You can hold the choir and hold the organ because we want something different. We want to have it our way, our way. 
Not at Burger, not at McDonald's, but like Burger King would. And so the attractional paradigm actually came up and said, we're going to create an unconscious wedding with consumerism, an attractive fit with the culture. Nobody likes the smell of a church basement. We need clean and sparkling restrooms, nice and safe nurseries, cool youth ministry. We need the best of everything and something for everyone. And it created a high pressure on more of everything. And the key question of evaluation in all attractional churches is how many came? How many were at the youth retreat? How many were at the college retreat? How many came on the women's retreat? How many were in Sunday school? How many came on Wednesday night? How many came on Sunday morning? And the object was get them back next week. And the problem was we had to have a very attractive everything. It became very staff driven, volunteerism declining. It was wearing on staff and leaders with how many as the constant focus. But we were aiming at felt needs. And we created ports of entry for all kinds of people beyond worship. We had to be competitive with other congregations. We built up new ministries that reach people in different ways. Divorce recovery, grief recovery, alpha, etc. We started having to distribute pastoral care a little bit because the pastor couldn't do it all. We built up deacons and Stephen ministries and all kinds of programmatic issues. We were actually still pretty light on discipleship because it was felt need focused. So we would offer short duration classes that were not about dying to self, but they were about enhancing self because that's what baby boomers wanted. The evangelism we did was to create fast decisions through great preaching or slower decisions through some programs or very focused decisions through something like Alpha, but the church did it. We didn't have to do it with our neighbors. We didn't have to do it at home. And boy, we built some big churches in this era, what we call mega churches. In 1970, we had very few mega churches. Now we've got a bunch of them that are big places, 22,000 in worship, 23,000 in worship, 24,000 in worship, 43,000 in worship. My goodness. We've even got one um, now in Birmingham that is somewhere around 48 thousand in worship in worshiping in 17 different sites Woo. it takes an amazing amount of energy to do this but while calstead who started the community church of joy in the phoenix area and wrote the famous book turn your church inside out meaning focus on those away actually had this evaluation of this attractional church. So our church strategy revolved around the gravitational force of entertainment for evangelism. We hired the best musicians we could afford. We used marketing principles, programming specialists for the gospel's sake, and attendance skyrocketed. More people meant more staff, more programs, more facilities, more land, and of course, the need for more money. We became a program-driven church attracting consumers looking for the latest and greatest religious presentation. After pouring more than 25 years of my life into this church, I knew we weren't developing disciples who were taking up their crosses to follow Jesus. We'd produce consumers like Pac-Man, gobbling up religious experiences, navigating a maze, but going nowhere in particular. Too many were observing the show, not meeting God. They meandered in and out of relationships, but weren't in real community. They sought their spiritual fix but didn't give themselves fully to Christ. So as a pastor for most of my life, I've, I've helped three different churches move from being a Christendom church to an attractional church. And in most cases it worked. It wasn't in the 22,000 range of the ones I showed you, but many of us in churches said, we're gonna have to do something to make this much more attractive to reach people who will then be drawn to this place. And what you are trying to offer is the highest spiritual inspiration for the lowest cost. And that's created a number of consumers. We've actually given birth to consumers in churches. In fact, we never heard the phrase, I'm shopping for a church, until this era started. Shopping and church are not words that naturally go together, but people would begin to look for the best inspiration at the lowest cost. And we as pastors watch people like migratory birds moving among various churches, trying to find one that was just a little bit better. So 
we built what we would call hybrids. We built an attractional church on top of a Christendom church. We might call it attractiondom. And some of the churches I pastored had a certain kind of service at one hour and a different kind of service at another hour. And through that, we thought we're going to still reach the Christendom folks and the attractional folks. But what we ended up doing is creating a culture that really fed consumerism. The common values of Christendom and attractional is that both happen inside a church building. In both, social and spiritual needs are met. In both, mission and discipleship are optional. And both are actually quite staff-centered. The challenge was, did we build self-sacrifice or self-fulfillment? The challenge is, is that cultures of staff got exhausted trying to run this. Leadership styles began to change. We didn't like to have questions. Money issues began to emerge. We've had some real challenges. Did we create disciples or spectators? Were we really just moving sheep around pastures or were we finding lost sheep? Was there too much focus on a clay pot or were we looking really at the treasure? So we've got some real questions about that. And the pragmatic reality is that today the attractional church is both plateaued in most places and declining in others. There are a few still growing and still thriving. But even the attractional churches in this part of the country are not thriving. It created an unsustainable pace, burnout and collapse. Many exceptions were abounding, but a lot of folks just finally got exhausted. And we've got all kinds of hybrids and knockoffs that are around. That leads us then to what we might want to call a third paradigm, which is missional. <clears throat> and in the missional context, the church begins to look like something else, a different thing. And I'll tell you where it came from. The missional church <clears throat> is the attempt to create a missionary encounter with the surrounding culture. It no longer assumes people know the faith. And it no longer assumes that the lost are just going to wander back into the church. The Mishnah Church believes that we must meet them on their territory. That's very different. Now, again, you wouldn't just set up a church in an atheistic country and expect people to come. You would realize we're going to have to build relationships with people. And through the building of relationships with people, we're going to be able to share our faith with people. And then eventually they may come to faith and may want to gather with Christian people as the church in China has done. But in our American churches, this is a different thing than we are used to. It's like, what game are we playing? Do we know how to play this game anymore? Because the missional church is actually calling us to be something different. The key verse that has sustained that is from John 20, 21. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. That word sending is in the word missio. The missio day is the sending of God. It's taking a church that has been very centripetal in its force where all feet are moving to the center and it's helping them move out. It's taking that inward church and moving it outward. That means that the location of missions and theology is actually moving from the doctrine of the church now to the doctrine of God. A church needs a mission or a mission needs a church. What is it? So it was Leslie Newbigin who came back to England after a long career as a missionary in China who recognized England is now a pagan society and the development of a truly missionary encounter with this very tough form of paganism is the greatest and intellectual and practical task facing the church. He realized if the church is going to reach this culture, we're going to have to act in a different way. What game are we actually playing? His concern was that society had become increasingly secular, that really the church just wasn't on their mind. And idolatrous, perhaps even worshiping reason or worshiping experience. A new apologetic would be needed to com communicate with these folks. But the key ingredient here is number four, the equipping of the laity. Oh, we had always had some classes on evangelism for those who wanted to do it. But it was not expected that that was going to be part and parcel of what it meant to be a Christian. But that the church community would also have to become more counter-cultural looking. 
we would have to avoid both syncretism and irrelevance of missing the culture on not understanding the culture or becoming too like the culture. And the pastor's job suddenly changes. William Willimon said, I find much to be committed in the image of pastor as a missionary or more accurately the lead missionary or an equipper of missionaries. We are no longer keeping house in an essentially hospitable and receptive culture if we ever were. That means that the pastor's job also changes. We don't have the ability to be the chaplain for everybody's particular need as well as equip you to be missionaries in the culture. If Western societies have become post-Christian mission fields, how can the traditional church become missional churches? How can we shift something which will often feel to a congregation like a bait and switch? Like, wait, we came in being one kind of church. Now you're asking us to be something else. So Tim Keller himself says, so a Christian is not a spiritual consumer coming in to get his or her emotional needs met and then going home. A missional church then is one that trains and encourages its people to be in mission as individuals and as a body. Are we trained to be missionaries? That's the key of the missional church. So Milford Manitria, a Baptist, has this definition. It's a reproducing community of authentic disciples being equipped as missionaries sent by God to live and proclaim his kingdom in their world. Have we been equipped and have we been sent into worship? So a missional church begins to develop some different practices. We begin to have a little higher threshold for what it means to be a member of a body. There's the centrality of personal discipleship, equipping to evangelize in our social and our vocational networks, learning to live apostolically as one who is sent the church has to commensurately become more simple, less internal, more external, not drawing people into the quarantine of life in a church, but actually equipping them to live in the world in different ways and placing concerns for the kingdom first. Membership as a call to missions means I believe, I belong, I behave, and I'm sent. I recognize that that's my essential part of my calling. The early church, when you study its history, they understood that they were sent on mission, not just here for my spiritual nurture, but that I really have a life to live in front of other people. To do that, it's going to take a renewed personal discipleship. One of the authors that wrote about this in the 70s called it the lost art of disciple making. And most churches have that as a lost art. People who study discipleship now say that around 5% of American churches are doing intentional discipleship. Oh, we all have classes. We all have places to grow and learn. But are we trying to shape disciples to lead disciples? Very few churches are thinking through the strategy of how to do that. Certainly the context for discipleship Part of it happens in preaching, part of it happens in large group teaching, part of it happens in small groups, and lots of churches in the attractional era had small groups, but often those become pooled ignorance. We don't really learn how to be disciples in some of those places. The micro expressions of a one-on-one -on -one or a one-on-three, that's a lost art in most places. So one of the things you'll have to wrestle with is do we have enough incubator of discipleship to really allow us to have something to say outside of the life of the church. I come from a Presbyterian tradition, and we don't do much evangelism. In fact, a Presbyterian shares their faith with an unbelieving person once every 15 years. That's not very often. I often tell my Presbyterian folks, this might be your year. But other traditions are not that much better. We don't often know what to say to unbelieving persons. So in Christendom, we did not emphasize discipleship. In the attractional church, we were focused on pastors and programs. The missional church actually requires very focused discipleship as part of who we are. And that means we're going to have to take a remedial approach for repair. We may have to start with us. If you're interested in a missions conference, it is likely that you're the prime candidates to be the core of a missional church. 
So we have to start with leaders. How have we been shaped? And patiently move that into the rest of a congregation. And then grow to acquire an evangelistic focus to train people to know how to share in their relational networks, how to share in their vocational networks, where we share with people at work. You know, I've done many a funeral for somebody and had people from their workplace say, wow, I never knew that person was a Christian because they learned in kind of the cultural, the cultural partnership we've tended to have, we'll just keep it under a bushel at work. We've got to know our neighbors again. Uh, we bought a house uh, out in Ipswich. The people who sold us the house said, you're going to love your neighbors. They will never bother you. I thought, oh dear, uh, we're going to have to disrupt the neighborhood because the only way to actually know your neighbors is to get involved in their lives. Most of us do not have the spiritual gift of evangelism, which allows us to share our faith rather naturally. Most of us have to learn what it means to be a witness. And that comes from the depth of discipleship. And that means we become apostolic, that the location of ministry changes. We don't expect them to come here. We're going to have to be equipped for out there and do our ministry among the people so that we become visible. Now, you're going to have to turn to your neighbor at some point and say, I think he's talking about something new and different. Yes, this is something we're not ready for in most cases. We're going to have to be prepared for we will also have to cultivate a simple church so that we don't quarantine people inside the church. If I were the devil, and if I had lost you to the kingdom of darkness, I would want you to touch as few people as possible. So I would want you in the church five nights a week at this Bible study, at this committee meeting, at this task force, so that you would have no time to learn about your neighbors. How do we not quarantine? It's one of the things about this moment with the, um, the virus that we're all facing, the coronavirus. We're kind of quarantining. We're going to have to use some of our social networks through digital networks to continue to reach people that live around us. And then we want to have a kingdom focus where churches are more interested in releasing than retaining where we plant new groups of believers in church plants, where our decision-making is decentralized around aligned values and the aligned values are with the kingdom of God so that it does not take so many people hours to manage a church, but rather to invest in people. Kierkegaard uh, tells a story about a jewelry store where a thief broke in at night, but he didn't steal anything. Instead, he just changed the price tags on everything so that what was really expensive looked cheap and what was really cheap looked expensive. That may have happened to us in the church. Maybe we've forgotten the real prices and the real cost. Leading toward being a missional church is complicated. A missions-minded church is what many of us thought was a missional church, but a missions-minded church is very important, but a missional church is different. It's about kingdom growth versus just congregational growth. It's a reversal of direction. It's going from come to go, from gathered to scatter, from centripetal to centrifugal, from internal to external, from settled to sent, to being a people of the exodus, going to the promised land, to be people in exile, living in a culture that is no longer really hospitable to us. It changes the pastor's role from that one little inspiring person to now an equipper and a cultural architect, a visionary who shares leadership in lots of ways. So many things, as I understand it, that have been happening at Westgate Church have gotten you on the road to this deeply in so many directions. And it's a matter of establishing this. The early changes is that your leaders begin to function differently. They have to come together to spiritually discern where is God leading us? How do we get focused discipleship and disciple making in place? How do we get our vision, our mission, and our plans all around what God is calling us to do? Because these things all begin to subtly change as you step into the missional world. And you've almost got to look at them one by one. How does that impact us? How does that change us? Because it's around our identity that we mostly make our changes when our identity gets reset. And we have to understand that 
that we need to have patience to watch this change occur because people are slow and we need to strive to have appropriateness in how we make changes because great change is really slow. And this is changing the game from the game we were playing to a very different game. So realistically, we will live for a time in some hybrids that are sort of Christendom attractional, Christendom missional, attractional missional, where we're kind of living in both worlds. But those hybrids also create a certain schizophrenia in the church as we're trying to do both things. And we want to eventually get clear. But once about 20% of your members are involved in missional experiments, you will discover that the culture changes. And it takes normally a local church about five to six years to make that transition. And the people who see this early are never going to be more than about 10% of the church. Your early adopters just don't see it. My guess is that some of you tuning into a missions conference are early adopters. And it's going to try the spiritual life of the leaders. Because we want to keep our, mission, our motives clear, our character in line, our vision our depth, our resilience, our perseverance, because all of these things require that we become accountable and vulnerable and something like an order around a mission. And that's not going to be easy. Machiavelli, who we usually don't quote at Gordon-Conwell, says there's nothing more difficult to carry out nor more doubtful of success nor more difficult to handle than to initiate a new order of things. For the reformer has enemies and all those who would profit by the old order and only lukewarm defenders and all those who would profit by the new. But this is a new vision of the new identity of the church as we move deeper and deeper into this 21st century. And I have to think that this coronavirus is going to have a part in reshaping our identity as a church. So I close with a picture of a dear old dog that's lying on a front porch of a West Virginia home where a pastor is making a visit on a parishioner who is there. And as they're talking on the front porch, the entire time the dog is whining. It's a pitiful little whine. And it's just hard to have a conversation while this dog is lying on the floor in between them, whining. And finally, the pastor said, okay, mister, what is it that's wrong with your dog? Why is it whining? The pastor said, oh, it's really not much. It's just lying on a nail. And the nail hurts it enough to whine, but not enough to move. And I find that old dog, the image of many of our congregations. We're not thriving the way we once were. We're not growing the way we once were. We're not growing with the same events and programs we once were. Maybe we're lying on a nail. And it's time for us to make a move and to become a different people of God and to learn to play a different game. It's going to take us a while to master it. We knew the other one. We don't know how to play this one. But I think this is our calling, and I think it takes us actually right back to the scriptures. Now, the, I hope you will have time in some format to be able to process and discuss this, but this is the paradigm we're in. We're moving into this missional paradigm for the church, and it's not easy. But God bless you as you are on this journey together. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us this evening for uh, this session of Life on Mission 2020. We're certainly thankful to Dr. Singleton for coming to join us for this time together. I hope that it's been a blessing to you, and I want to uh, just let you know about a resource that's been valuable to me as I have thought about these, uh, these conversations, these topics uh, of, of moving toward missionality as a church. And that book is uh, the, Reason, or <laughs> the Mission of God by Chris Wright. Uh, this book is, it's, well, you can see it's very thick. Um, and it is helpful because it helps me understand that the Bible as a whole is missional in its posture, right? That God expresses himself 
uh, through Scripture as a missional God, a God who is on mission to reach people, to reach the lost, and to bring them to himself. Uh, it, this book has helped me to understand the whole Bible and to understand God better, and it certainly helps me to think uh, missionally as a pastor, as a follower of Jesus Christ, and as someone who is uh, leading a church that is called to be on mission. So I hope that you will take some time to consider uh, reading a very thick but very, very good book. Um, and uh, it's a, we, have, we have some copies here at the church. If you're interested, you can let us know, uh, or you can just look it up on Amazon yourself if you want to do that. If you have questions uh, that came up uh, for you during our session this evening that you want to submit for our panel discussion tomorrow, I'll remind you to just send those to us at lifeonmissionquestions at gmail.com. Just send them along and we will begin compiling a list of questions that we will try to tackle during our panel discussion tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening and we'll see you in the morning.